Well, it's uh, been a week of high drama. Well, let's cut straight to the chase. Really a high week of farce in Canberra <laughs> surrounding issues like Craig Thompson and the like. They continue to dominate the parliament. Now, on Wednesday, Tony Abbott and Christopher Pine, of course, added to the fun when they fled the chamber to avoid accepting Mr Thompson's vote. Now, for a look at the week that was, the former leader of the Democrats, Natasha Stott Despoja, is with us in the studio. And from Adelaide, we're joined by the former Liberal Foreign Minister, Alexander Downer. And uh, thanks to both of you for joining us in the fray on what really has been a terrible week uh, and one of many that seem to be building up. Even the Deputy Speaker now, Anna Burke, is saying she's never seen anything like this in her 14 years. Well, I've been out of Parliament for almost four years now and I can't remember comparable scenes and I was in almost 13 years and I don't remember the level of nastiness been quite like this and even visiting recently I was shocked by uh, the venom of, uh, of some of the uh, yeah, discussions in the place. Really sad, I think. Yeah, Alexander Dander, how has it got to this? Well, I wouldn't um, uh, overstate this. With no disrespect to my friend Natasha, I do think that former politicians tend to look back and think of better times. Maybe we all do that a little bit in life. But um, I have to say, having been a, a cabinet minister and sitting through question time and being grilled in question time over the years, um, the House of Representatives has always been a very robust place and there have been times when it's become extremely bitter. I remember when I um, was in opposition and Paul Keating was the Prime Minister, I don't remember his kindly words towards the opposition. So I mean I think it's, it's very robust. I think Julia Gillard makes a fundamental mistake by concentrating as the Prime Minister so much on the opposition. She should leave that to her ministers and concentrate on broader issues um, because ultimately she's the boss of the place and uh, she has to set a different tone and it's important she thinks about that. Natasha, you're shaking your head oh, look, in disbelief. Um, well, you know, my, my former colleague has immediately sheeted home the blame to the, the leader and the Prime Minister of the country. Now, I think both leaders have a role to play in uh, making sure that there's a degree of civility and dignity that we're not seeing. Having said that, I'm not sure if it's some atavistic tendency or maybe some nostalgia among former politicians to, you know, remember better times, because some of us went through some really difficult and negative times. And yes, that it is a robust place, but I defy many commentators or any former politician or even the public to come up with a time when they think it was quite as nasty as this. It's really unedifying. Well, I, I, I'll, me I'll meet the challenge. Um, <laughs> when, I was in when I was in opposition and Paul Keating was the Prime Minister, it was extremely bitter. Um, the invective was, was truly horrible at times. So. Uh, you know, the House of Representatives is a, is a tough and robust place. No, but I do think, I mean, I'm sticking with that, I do think that ultimately the Leader of the Opposition is just that, the Leader of the Opposition. Ultimately it's the Prime Minister of the country who sets the tone. And um, uh, Keating set a particular tone, Howard set a particular tone, Hawke did, and Gillard does. Um, and she, I think, needs to recognise that spending as the Prime Minister, not the Labor Party or the Ministers, but as the Prime Minister, spending so much of question time just lashing out at the opposition is, is, is quite unproductive and it obviously incites them into fiercer and fiercer opposition. So, you know, ultimately if you're the Prime Minister, you're the person with the greatest power and that brings with it the greatest responsibility. Yeah, point taken, Alexander Downer, and, and the times were fairly torrid in the 1990s, but you never sat through the spectacle that we all witnessed on Wednesday with uh, Tony Abbott and Christopher Pine bolting to the doors to avoid getting associated <laughs> with what they see as the tainted vote of Craig right. Thompson. It was very unedifying, wasn't it? Well, uh, that, uh, I mean, you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, if they had just stayed there and um, taken Thompson's vote, then there would have been howls of hypocrisy and abuse and denigration for doing that when Abbott had said he wouldn't accept the tainted vote of Craig Thompson. So he had to uh, had to try to deal with that. I suppose it didn't look great on TV. But well, I mean, that's that an is, understatement. That, that is, a, is a minor incident. Nothing much hangs on that, though. 
See, Tony Abbott had been training for this. All these triathlons, <laughs> all these bike rides, and, and still he, he still missed ready. it. So, <laughs> but no, and I, I, I try and make light of it only because it is, it is so farcical. I mean, most mm. of the time we've all spent our time running two divisions, not running out of them. And uh, I think this exemplifies why it's got so silly, um, and particularly on the issue of, of Craig Thompson. Alexandra, it seems very intent not to, in fact, examine the role of Tony Abbott. And I mean, Bill Kelty quite rightly said the other day, why are they complaining? That's the job he's in. He's in opposition and he's in that position to beat mm. him. But his, his, his role and his message seems to be very simplistic and very attacking. The, uh, I, I, well, hold, this how can is, you describe this is it a... any other way? This is a narrative of the Labor Party, um, who are now the government. But when the Labor Party were the opposition, um, it is all they did. You see, I, I was the foreign minister for nearly 12 years. I, I have to say, my memory hasn't just been expunged since I left the parliament. Do I you can really remember think Kim Beasley, the though, Kim Beasley, though well, did I don't think not he was, behave oh, like that? Dear, dear Kim Beasley, <laughs> um, he was terribly poor at it. He was a very weak leader of the opposition, but he tried to do it the whole time. And, and when it comes to negativity, I can't remember, by the way, a single major initiative of the Howard government, which was supported by the Labor Party. Everything we did, they opposed, continually opposed it. There were manoeuvres in the parliament to try to defeat things and so on. Now, I'm not complaining about this, by the way. Um, it's, it's the nature of the adversarial political system that we have in our country. And honestly, it may sound bad, but it served us as a country pretty well over the years. Um, but Tony Abbott, as, as distinct from Kim Beasley, is just very good at being the leader of the opposition. He's very effective. And all that his, his opponents can say is, oh, well, he's negative. He's the leader, as Bill Kelty said, he is the leader of the opposition. It's his job to test and challenge the government every day of the week. That's his job. He's but not the negative. Prime Minister. Well, look, nobody doubts the role of an opposition is to hold governments to account. There's a difference, though, between providing an alternative perspective, an alternate government. And I think that Tony Abbott is lauded for his strategic abilities. In terms of saying no, it's been very useful. It's played up to some elements of the public on a range of issues. And, of course, sometimes you're not going to agree. I mean, you know, I've been, I was in a minor party. We're in perpetual opposition. You know, we weren't going to attain executive power. Mm. Sometimes you had to oppose or change. But there's a big difference between that strategic approach of saying no for the sake of it on occasions and actually offering a constructive alternative. And I think that's what we're missing at the moment. Having said that, you know, I look at someone like the Deputy um, Leader of the Opposition, Julie Bishop, offering views on Assange or Syria. There is constructive policy making going on on both sides, but we're not hearing about yep. it. And Ali, uh, sticking well, I with think, I yep, Alexander, yep. Yeah, sorry, I think it, it's, it's a, in a sense a function of the issues though here, of course, and, and Natasha's quite right to refer to some of the more positive things that other people, well, including Tony Abbott, have said from time to time. Uh, but what Tony Abbott has done is concentrate very heavily his activity on one issue, and that is the carbon tax. Of course, the coalition does have a positive response to this issue, and that's to abolish it. Um, and that's a policy and a very constructive policy in the eyes of many people. But he has concentrated his fire very heavily on that one issue. Um, I mean, not only pre presumably because he dislikes the carbon tax, but because it penetrates the community. Uh, but, I mean, he often has positive things to say, but, you know, they're on page 16 of the newspaper. <laughs> Um, mm. But, you know, it's the nature of Australian adversarial politics, honestly. Well, Natasha, in the midst of all of this ugliness, of, we had that news poll which showed uh, a small, but as Labor would see it, promising bump in Labor's standing. We had the Prime Minister telling caucus, well, this is the start of the Labor Party's 500-day turnaround ahead of the next election campaign. Mm. Do you see the government's fortune changing any time soon? Look, I don't see that happening any time soon. But, of course, the interesting thing about polls or even preferred prime ministerial uh, research is that polls um, is that people are equally, I think, disillusioned with uh, leadership on mm. the other side of politics. I, I think what disturbs me most is that there is actually good work going on in that place. I was there last week. I watched Senate estimates. I observed the parliament. People are working together, not always across the spectrum as they should, but they're working on legislation and that's being lost. So government is functioning uh, to an extent. There's a, le a level of dysfunction as well. And these policy uh, and, and legislative wins are not 
translating. So I think that last poll was more a measure of we're really sick and tired of the Craig Thompson saga, whether it's one side or the other. But I don't see the fortunes changing particularly And Alexander Danner, that, that very same opinion poll said that, of course, the, uh, the coalition still has that uh, thumping uh, we, uh, lead on the two-party preferred basis, but voters don't like Tony Abbott. Well, um, first of all, I think Natasha's right. I think uh, voters, um, certainly my take from the community, have no uh, taste for Craig Thompson, but I think they think the parliament could talk about other things, not just Craig Thompson. So I think that, in a sense, has um, exhausted their patience a bit as an issue, and I think the poll shows that. Um, the second thing I'd say is um, that I think in the Liberal Party, um, in all honesty, they're fairly pleased to see some small recovery by the Labor Party and Julia Gillard because I think from their point of view they think their best prospects, for right or for wrong, they think their best prospects at the next election are for Julia Gillard to remain the Prime Minister. But having said that, um, I've always um, made the argument that in Australia those two major parties, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party, have a big base of support. Um, and you never want to underestimate either of those parties in the middle of a parliamentary term. I mean, here you have everybody talking about the, the next election and what's going to happen at the next election. It's well over a year away. Um, we're only halfway through the parliamentary term. Labor members are said to be very depressed about their poor, poor ratings, but they have over a year to go. They should be depressed if they're like this three months before the election. But 500 or whatever it is days before the election, there's no need for them to panic yet. To panic now. Natasha, just briefly, in terms of, you know, you've got a role in Beyond Blue and, and the, 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 the attacks that have been going on to Craig Thompson. I mean, that finally sort of perhaps stopping just understanding that he is very close to the edge and that should really be very, very carefully there's considered. A, de a degree of human frailty, obviously, but, uh, you know, obviously he has to be held account for, uh, you know, alleged... Uh, wrongdoings. That should be dealt with, not necessarily by the parliament, but by courts. And Mal Washer, Dr Washer, I thought was uh, a wonderful example of how parliamentarians can behave Indeed. when he said, mm. let's look out for each other. Parliament has a duty of care. It's not just about that one individual, but I think parliament should set a standard that Australians can look up to and respect. And that's not happening at the moment. A final comment from you, Alexander Danner. Well, you're held account in, uh, to account in public life. It's not like private life. If you don't want to go into public life, you don't have to. If you go into public life um, and you become um, accountable for something that you at least in this case allegedly have done, which is pretty egregious, um, it's an allegation, but it was a series of allegations, but it's egregious, it inevitably is going to lead to an enormous amount of scrutiny. Senior politicians, cabinet ministers, prime ministers, opposition leaders are put under enormous um, scrutiny, uh, massive abuse day in and day out. You've got to be able to cop it. That is, it's not compulsory to be a politician. Um, you can leave politics and Craig Thompson could just leave politics if he wanted to. Natasha Stott, it's very lovely to have you with us in the studio, pleasure. and Alexander Downer too. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.